Welcome back to Tattoos, Code, and Data Flows. I'm Matt Rose, your host for the podcast. Very excited today. We have an AppSec expert, somebody I've worked with a bunch of in the past. His name is Mark Geeslin. He is in the, the Nashville market and had a lot of different roles in terms of AppSec and expertise. Uh, really excited to have him today. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Well, welcome, Mark. It's great having you. It's been a while since we spoke. The whole pandemic has really kept me from traveling, and we'd see each other a few times a year in the Nashville market. I want to introduce my guest, Mark Eastlin. Mark is an AppSec expert. I've dealt with him for a bunch of years on all things application security. Mark, why don't you introduce yourself for the uh, for the audience? Tell them what your background is and uh, the day in the life of Mark. Sure. Well, thanks, first of all, Matt, for having me on here. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here, and I'm um, looking forward to our conversation. So my background has been a fairly long one. It started out in software development back in the day when uh, <laughs> uh, we were writing C code a lot and C++ code. I uh, was in software development in various and sundry uh, companies, startup companies, massive companies, all sorts and shapes and sizes. Uh, for, for, you know, a couple of decades before I actually went full time into the AppSec, uh, an AppSec role. Prior to that, I was dabbling in security quite a bit and uh, worked in companies, some security startups, but it was all in the development capacity. So, but that sort of lended itself naturally, as you know, to go into product security, application security space, which I did uh, probably, I don't know, it's close to 15 years ago now. And have loved it, been doing it ever since. Have uh, spent a good deal of time building up product security teams and uh, red teams as well. So both offensive security, product security. In my current role, I'm actually, it's quite different. I'm actually ahead of all security. So that's the first time I've ever done this uh, where I have to kind of worry about the whole enchilada. But uh, uh, so there are different challenges than I've had to face before in product security space. Oh, that's good. New challenges are always good. Keep you fresh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, it was, I always liked working with you. You always, uh, you know, I've worked out with a lot of application security professionals, and Mark, you actually got it. You actually got it. We had it. We could have real conversations, and you actually understood the landscape, which I appreciate it because sometimes people, <clears throat> excuse me, just really want to uh, just spit out acronyms and everything. And yeah. you were you were on it, and you really put me uh, to task a lot of times, <laughs> which I appreciate. Well, you were pretty on it as well, so we got along pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, well, why don't we jump in? The first section, uh, this is called Thinking Out Loud. I'm thinking out loud. Thank you, Ed Sheeran. So, Mark, this is, you know, what do you think about in terms of your role in AppSec and security as a whole these days? What What is the thing that you wake up thinking about or the thing that you're uh, most focused on in terms of your responsibilities these days? Yeah, well, and I know... Uh, I know this particular broadcast is focused mostly on product security in my in my current role. That's just part of my part of my role. So my mind hasn't probably been quite as fruit, fruitful in um, in the product security space lately because I've just had to worry about so many other things. But a number of things I think that are I both find interesting and uh, challenging as um, one is uh, is in the just general security operation space, which is the, the traditional SOC versus the managed SOC, uh, which I've had to definitely dive into that. I've really come to uh, kind of change my perspective on, on that, having always worked in larger shops with traditional SOCs. Not really seeing the value of a traditional SOC now versus the managed SOC, except in some rare cases. But um, uh, that's one thing I've been thinking a lot about red teaming and the value of red teaming. I think there's a definitely been some spot places where they've been, uh, it's been, I think, um, underappreciated and uh, particularly with a lot of emphasis on purple teaming space and buzzwords about purple teaming. So I've, uh, that's another thing on my mind. I'm pretty passionate about the value of red teams. Used to consider it, um, kind of a nice to have. And now I'm at this place where I think, I think it's an essential component of the security. Why, why do you think that is all of a sudden, you know, going nice to have to a essential? Well, um, before I had ever had to build one, um, when I was back at Assurian, um, that was actually the last piece of our uh, security program that I built there. And in conjunction with jo Joel Tomasini and Casey Rossini, and uh, we had some outside consultation with Peter Kim and some others, but 
we built our red team and just to see the, uh, the tremendous value that it brought in terms of actually allowing us to be far more efficient on what we're focusing on because the, you know, the red teaming is one, yes, uh, red team members love to find the problems, but, uh, and, uh, they're very good at that, but it's also very valuable at validating where your security program is working. So it, it, it's an awesome tool if you have a good red team, right? Of course, you have to yeah. have the right people. They have to have the right skill set, and that's not easy to do. But if you've got that, it is, it is an extremely valuable tool for actually directing the security program in general, where it should focus, validating what you're doing well, and uncovering areas that you, you may not have even been aware of where you really need to strengthen your program. And be, that's just from a technical standpoint, but then once uh, from a, from a, from a kind of upper management visibility perspective as well, it's, uh, uh, it, I found it extremely effective and actually demonstrating to, uh, executive management, why we need to invest more in certain areas. You know, it's, you've probably heard it many times, right? When you, it's a lot, it's a lot more valuable to demonstrate a problem than to talk about it in a theoretical and yep. uh, the red team, it's not just, it's not very different from pen testing, right? Pen testing is extremely focused on a particular, uh, maybe application or a particular network or something along those lines. Red teaming can, can do things such as like, hey, I want to see uh, from a, a, emulate an attacker behavior uh, completely across the board, covert, uh, blue team doesn't know anything about this is happening. And can I actually compromise, for example, a customer service? Representatives desktop and thereby get into the network and from there get into our our, uh, our product space in, our, in the cloud and actually begin to exfiltrate exfiltrate date our data right something gotcha. broad like that with many pieces involved and then you can through that process right you find where the weaknesses are and where the strengths are and um, and where you need to really focus so it's a enables you to be far more effective overall in how what you where you spend your dollars and your time yeah, absolutely and it's a i always had that that question of prove it you, you have an issue okay you know how is this going to propagate itself how is this going to happen then you have to go in and explain the story and i think it's really important because it really helps with not just identification but remediation because you're not just telling them there's a problem you're actually providing a a holistic story to to understand both identification and remediation yeah. Yeah. So it proved to be extremely valuable when I was, uh, when, uh, the, the program we built and, uh, in, in very quickly, I mean, very, very quickly. And they, they had broad skill sets, so they can concentrate on all kinds of things. They could attack the applications, but they could also go after the, uh, you know, the, uh, on-premise networks or the Wi-Fi or whatever it may be, the zoom rooms, whatever it may be. Right. And, uh, yeah, um, so, yeah, we found it very valuable. It uh, really validated what we were doing well, and it was uh, it gained us a lot. We we had a pretty good relationship with executives in our company, but it even improved that. So, um, and you know, there's this, there's been this uh, with the purple team and thing. There are folks that will sometimes go, well, you know, you really need to work well with the blue team, and that's true. But I still the value really is in that. What, what I was talking about with the red team uh, and purple teaming is kind of cool and nice to do, but that the real value comes from the red team. And um, I'm not, I'm not downplaying blue team. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not as uh, excited about purple teaming. as sort of some folks are. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that is sort of distracted. And I've even encountered that with folks that go, well, they're very reluctant to go for a full blown red team approach because they're afraid of possible uh, inefficiencies between them and the blue team and that sort of thing. But if you do it well, you have a good company culture, right? And, and we had no issue with it. Uh, both blue team and red team respect, respect each other very much. So, and uh, we got along extremely well, so. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's great information. Now, the next section is uh, what most of my guests really uh, enjoy the most. It's the rant session. So let's, oh, right. Liam, let's start the rant session. Here you go. I got a lot of problems with you people. <laughs> now, you're going to hear about it. So this is your opportunity. What ticks you off on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, either from internal or external or whatever? What's, yeah. what's the biggest thing that ticks you off? There's a couple. 
couple of things, but I, I'd say something that, um, that really, you, you probably heard me talk about this. I, I mean, I literally was just talking to someone about this uh, from a different, another vendor on the phone this morning. I, I understand why this happens. I'm, I'm all for capitalism, free market. I know what venture <laughs> capitalists are doing. They, they, they're, they, they, they're making money. That's what they care about, right? So I understand all that. I'm not an idealist. I'm a realist about that. But I think what really sucks for the, for the industry and the craft of security itself is um, when you uh, these startup companies come out and they got really awesome stuff. And I've seen this multiple times highly motivated uh, folks that want to um, achieve great things for the craft, right? And for the industry. Um, yeah. And then they end up getting acquired by larger companies that don't really understand fully the value of what this, the company they just acquired is doing and don't continue on the culture of innovation that existed. So that I've just seen over and over and over again, some really awesome companies in the serverless security space and, and other spaces that have been acquired by larger companies. And then all of their innovation just seems to be gone and all of the effort is being put into integration into the larger corporate in ecosystem, you know, that the conglomerate has. That ticks me off a lot. I know it's not gonna go away, <laughs> just because I understand <laughs> what's behind all this, right? Is uh, yeah. the dollars and cents. But I would, I wish we could get someone out there that would actually have enough, uh, uh, enough appreciation of the industry and enough money and backing behind them that they could, uh, you know, like an Elon Musk type of a person, but in the security space that would actually be able to, um, you know, take a company uh, public instead of the acquisition route and really uh, bring them to, to, to their full um, capacity uh, and potential in, in this, at that specific, specific uh, niche that they're in. Yeah, I've been part of uh, some of those acquisitions in my career, and it's a lot of the innovation and culture tends to disappear. And, uh, you know, it's like, you, you know, working with you, uh, you know, as a smaller company, and then you get bought by a bigger company, sometimes that you can't bring as much kind of, uh, I don't know, thought leadership, interesting aspects, because, yeah. you know, you're part of a, co you know, much bigger corporate culture, which, again, yeah. is kind of like de death and taxes, it happens. Yeah, and I worked with lots of startups, and they'll hear me rant about this all the time. <laughs> because I'll go, when are you guys getting acquired? Because I love what you're doing, but I mean, I know it's going to slow down once you guys get acquired. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's just the reality. Yeah, like you said, death and taxes and acquisitions in the security space that uh, we can't avoid them. But uh, they definitely um, have a downside to them, yeah. No. Awesome. Well, thank you for your candor. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, here's your opportunity to say what you like. This is Nirvana World. Oh, Nirvana Mark, if you World. could. Okay, yeah. The, uh... Or you from Nirvana. So, you know, if you could, you know, architect out what would be a perfect world for you and your job or your responsibilities in the security space. If you could architect anything, what would it be? What would make you the happiest in a Nirvana world? Yeah, um, well, you know, the ideal world, the Nirvana world, that's hard to see. But uh, I mean, one aspect was sort of my, my Elon Musk sort of analogy there, but yeah. uh, in that specific space. But I do think, you know, I'm very, very happy with the, the cultural shift that has happened in the last, what has it been now? It's been probably 13 years, right, since DevOps uh, really uh, debuted, I think it was 2009 when uh, that, that first came out. Um, I think there's still a ton of potential and upside for the DevOps, DevSecOps world. It's not a fad, right? It's yeah. not something that, uh, it, it's the way it should have probably always been done, right? And, <laughs> um, you know, there's lots of fads that occur, both in software development world, the security world, and they come and they go. But the philosophy behind DevOps and the culture, the CAMS culture, right, um, is uh, in principles, the, they're going to just continue to grow. The automation, the measurement, right, the cultural shift, um, the, the, all of that, I think we still, we've not, we've only, we've seen so much benefit from it. And not and yeah. not just in the development world, product development world, huge, but in the security world as it's moved to DevSecOps. 
And long ago, I drank the DevSecOps Kool-Aid before they were even calling it DevSecOps. I still think we have a lot, a lot more to do. And what I'd love to see, uh, I know automation is kind of a buzzword, but we really yep. have so much data out there. We have with infrastructure with code, with compliance code, with everything is code, with GitOps and all of this. There is so much potential, greater potential for, uh, for analytics and uh, intelligence and automation in the security space, which we haven't seen yet. And so that is what I'm most excited about seeing that. Um, we still, for like example, on the SaaS side, there's just, they're, they're only beginning to do things that I was hoping to see happen a long time ago, which is where uh, there should be a lot more done with what is a, a man, maybe a managed machine learning experience where the SaaS tool, I'm just using this for example, but it's like, yeah. With all that it's continuing to find and all of the, the remediation issues and code that it could look at, why can it not begin to figure this out, the tool to figure this out for itself? Why is it we got to still have security engineers and developers go in and figure out how to fix this code? Some of the vendors are starting to go down that space, looking at open source mm -hmm. code and fixes and out there. Um, it still needs to be basically uh, you know, managed and um, curated, if you will. And I just think there's so much more that can be done there and uh, not just in a low, one space like SaaS, but across the board of security, product security tools, interacting with one another, learning from one another, and uh, just improving uh, the, with the, the, the level of efficiency and uh, accuracy of uh, remediation. So that's something I'm excited to see happen. Uh, more of. No, I, I agree with you. One of the biggest things is you could have the most uh, technically advanced product, but if it can't be integrated and automated into the existing DevOps processes, it's not going to be used because it has to be part of the ecosystem, not not a side tangent or a, a separate process. It needs to just be part of the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, another fun section that people tend to like, we're going to move into the speed round now. Okay. <laughs> So I have my questions for you. These are just quick questions. It's like Mark's opinion on these things and, you know, just uh, providing a little bit of food for thought for the audience. Uh, some of these are a little bit, you know, controversial, depends on who you talk to, but, you know, just feel free to answer them as you best fit. Do you feel that it's the term is DevOps or DevSecOps? Because I've been bit on this a bunch of times. What is the correct term or are they two separate things? Yeah, I think there's definitely DevSecOps is, uh, um, because we do need to incur uh, include security as a as first class citizen in that mix. So I do favor DevSecOps. I understand DevOps, yeah, it's fine, but it's uh, but that was prior to us including security, and now we've got security in the mix. So if we're going to do it well, we can need to include all three of those. And so I think DevSecOps. Gotcha. In your job, what is your go-to product? What 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 can't you live without? And I mean, there could be anything from a, a technical solution to just a organizational solution. What um, this is to trying to help people, you know, find new cool things to get be more productive. What is your go-to piece of software, or device, or whatever? Yeah, you don't mean a specific product necessarily, but a type of product, like yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can mention whatever you want. It's totally you know, uh, it's your opinion. <laughs> I'll be controversial. I'll make some enemies here. I think. Okay, but, uh, let's do it. This is a product. I have loved, which is signal science, it's right. I have loved what they do. They, 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 they're, it's fairly narrow what they do, but they do it extremely well, right? Uh, it's basically an intelligent, they like to call it next gen WAF RAS, but it's very, it's, it's just way beyond it's, uh, what a WAF can do. It's almost self-managed. I've loved it and tools like that, right? Is a kind of an essential web application security tool. Uh, they're not the only ones doing that, but they're, they're not a lot of players that are doing it that well. Problem is they were acquired by Fastly. <laughs> so, uh, they were acquired by Fastly about a year ago. So I'm so far, everything's fine, but I'm worried about where they're going to take it. Right. It's, yeah. uh, it, again, it's the whole issue I mentioned before about acquisition. So, but, uh, I love that. I think it's an essential tool. I mean, there's a number of things, right? I mean, SaaS and SCA, very, very critical to product security. To me, it's like, if you're not mm -hmm. doing it, you're just derelict. 
right? And it's, so you've got to have those tools in place, obviously in the broader space, you gotta have a SIM, uh, a SIM in place. Um, yeah, those are, uh, those are some of them. There's obviously testing tools that, that you need as well. And so there's a handful of things I think are essentials. Yeah. Okay. Next question, uh, you know, in your professional or even, you know, personal, who do you look up to in the space? You know, who do you think is a thought leader that you uh, like to follow on Twitter or, or their their blogs or things like that? Is there somebody that you feel is, uh, and this could be anybody, even from a, you know, a, yeah. I don't know, pop culture type space. Is there anybody that yeah. you really look up to? Well, it's, it's uh, I mean, he pops into my mind just because of what I was just talking about, but Zane Lackey in the DevOps space and DevSecOps space. I mean, he was one of the founders of Signal Sciences, but um, I've always admired him. Uh, followed him, you know, he's not as active now as he used to be, but uh, that, that, that the, the DevOps thought leaders, Gene Kim, those guys, um, I really admire and uh, look up to. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So this is again, a little bit of a controversial one. I have my own opinions on this. People don't like it. Do you feel shift left is still a thing or do you think it's becoming less and less a thing based off of aggressive DevOps CICD pipelines? Yeah. Well, I think it, it, uh, I think as a buzzword, we should just kill it, right? <laughs> I think we should get rid of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shift left. I go, wait, we should have been shifting left. A de We've been shifting left for decades. Now, can we just drop the term? And when I hear it, I feel like ah, I, I almost, I discount them, the people that are saying it somewhat when they say it, because I go, whoa, 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 you're kind of just getting to this party now. I mean, come on, <laughs> this has been going on for a long time. So I like, I, but are we supposed to still shift left? Yes, but we're shifting right as well. We've got with okay. the, the DevOps and with the monitoring and with live real-time production, we, we need to do it all. We need to be shifting yeah. left, but we also are shifting right in the sense that in terms of our monitoring and those feedback loops, um, so it's really, uh, we've got to cover the whole gamut, but I think yeah. the term shift left, we should sort of drop because it's just at this point, it's become just a meaningless buzzword. Yeah. When I, when I hear shift left, I usually say, you mean shift everywhere? Yeah. <laughs> that's what I, I think you should shift everywhere. Because right. it's like exactly. the, ent the entity that you're looking at is constantly changing as it moves through the DevOps life cycle. So right. how can you look at it in one, one specific area? Cause it's going to be different in another area. Yeah, so I, I appreciate your feedback. Yeah. That's the beauty of the whole, uh, the whole DevOps idea and concept I, in the, in, from the security perspective. It's not that there's the magic, you know, and we all know there's no silver bullet, but it's not like, oh, this particular piece of the security program or in the SDLC security pipeline is what's critical. It's like, no, it's that it's the combination of all the pieces and the multiple layers and the feedback loops and how they all do a piece of it. None of them do it perfectly, but if we have enough layers in there and we have enough, enough components working together, we're going to be far more secure and we are far more secure than we were in the day when we were trying to do it all at these sort of fixed points in a, in a sort of a waterfallish kind of way. Yeah. Oh, awesome. All right. We're moving to our next section called uh, expert witness. Your honor, I move to disqualify Ms. Vito as an expert witness. Can you answer the question? No, it is a trick question. Problem. No, no trick questions for you, Mark. But, but you know, it's kind, it's kind, it's kind of a controversy yet, Matt. I don't know. Let's see what we can do here. It's been, it's been good enough. It's been good enough. Uh, so, thinking about a question based on your experience with you know your current role and your role at Assurian, a lot of times people just have scanners and they point them and they're great at identification but terrible at remediation. In your experience. What is the best way to remediate risk, not just identify it? Because a lot of times people just turn stuff on and they just create reams of data and they don't do anything with yeah. it. Yeah. How have you been successful getting remediation out of your organization? Um, you know, it's it's not it's not particularly uh, you know it's clearly not something I've thought up, but I mean, it's, uh, a lot of folks would say, yeah, yeah, of course, but it's the the those those who's doing the scanning, who's seeing the results of the scan. It has to be the folks that actually have the ability to fix the stuff. So that's shift left. <laughs> Let's put those tools in the hands of the development, the product teams, 
not in a central security space, sure, central security, I'm in central security, uh, right? We can monitor, oversee, direct, use, you know, establish consistency and that sort of stuff. But the, the folks ingesting that need to be the product teams so they can actually respond to them. They can decide what's false positive. They can refine the tool. They can, ref, uh, you know, make it more efficient in what it's finding. So it has to be something that's actionable and real. We have to definitely get rid of the noise, and then um, and put the uh, the output of those things into the hands of the right people. Um, so I've, that's where I've seen the most success. Yeah. So that's that that's where I would go with that. I do yeah, think I it's almost. It's almost worse to just continue to discover vulnerabilities and not yeah. do anything about it. It's like, um, at least if you didn't have that data, you would say, hey, we didn't know we had the vulnerability. <laughs> Once you know you have the vulnerability, you didn't do anything about it. Now you're, now you're like negligent, right? I mean, so. Exactly. It's like, if you're not going to do anything about it, don't bother discovering it. But please discover <laughs> it and act on it at the same, at the same time. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I like to say remediate on the right. And then uh, actually identify on the right and remediate on the left. Yeah. So it's that ecosystem of, you know, constant ebb and flow because, you know, that, that entity that you're building is constantly in every stage of the DevOps process if you're in a very aggressive cycle to constantly change. So it's yeah. like you find it on the right or you find it with automation and then you push it through automation or defect tracking or whatever to the left for remediation. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, one more quick question for you. And this one is more of a, a cultural thing. I don't know if you've seen a lot of the, the conversation on uh, LinkedIn recently about what I have a lot of is tattoos. I'll bring it into oh, the picture. Okay. And the tattoo is co uh, the uh, podcast is called Tattoos, Code and Data Flows, especially with your activity with your 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 organization, Music City Con, what's your take on tattoos in the workspace? Is this something you see a lot of? It's like, do you do you look at people's skill set and it doesn't matter if they have tattoos? What's, yeah. what's your take yeah, on the yeah. whole tattoo movement? Yeah, I could be real controversy here too, if you want, man. No, <laughs> go, go for it. <laughs> I don't have any. Wow, it's like I'm the oddball. But it's, um, so, you know, I have my like personal view of my, you know, but in terms of the work environment, um, I like that. I don't even, it makes no difference to me whatsoever. Right. So it's, yeah. uh, um, it's become so common that honestly, I don't even, um, uh, like I didn't even remember you had, you know, like so you had to do that. Right. So it was, it's so common and, and it's been in my space because I've been a work a lot in the offensive security space as well. Yeah. Right. The DEF CON crowd and those guys, they've been doing that for a long time. So it's, yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's, um, I don't even, yeah, consider it. It's, uh, I mean, uh, some tattoos I think are rather beautiful and some not so much, right? <laughs> so it's that, uh, you know, my own That's like anything. concern, I hope you and all your, your tattoo guys are thinking about is what, what if you change your mind, right? So if it, it's like, if you could get the tattoo and, and then like in, in a year I decide, I don't like that one, I'm going to change it. I would like have no, no problem personally with it at all. It's more yep. of the fact it's semi-permanent. I know you, there's probably techniques, you know more about this, I'm sure, but yeah. of getting them off if you change your mind. But, um, yes. but you guys got to make sure whatever you put on there, you don't mind it being on there in 30 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. Totally agree. Well, well Mark, it's been, it's been a great conversation, but just like any uh, conversation, it's got to come to an end. Closing time. You don't have to go home, but you can. So I want, to, well, I want to thank you for being here, but this is your opportunity to stand on your soapbox, discuss anything from a, a charitable organization, uh, an organization you're running, you know, give us, uh, you know, something that you, that's very um, interesting and, and, and something you enjoy. Yeah. Well, um, uh, you know, COVID definitely put a crimp on this, but um, so the last two years we've been dormant, but prior to that, um, I did start an organization and we had two conferences, uh, Music City Con is what we called it. It is a, it is a nonprofit organization. Um, uh, and what I wanted to do is particularly three years ago, Nashville, the, the, the security kind of culture in Nashville was just not as strong as I, from a technical standpoint as I wanted to see. So we have a lot of healthcare here. And so we have a lot of strength in kind of the compliance side. 
uh, but we did not have as much strength on the technical side. So that's why I started Music City Comp, to focus on that, focus on technical product security and offensive security side of things, kind of like a DEF CON, but, uh, but with, a, with more of a product security focus and also a kinder, gentler DEF CON in, uh, <laughs> in Nashville. And so uh, the plan is to uh, uh, resurrect it this fall and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have an in-person conference here again if things keep moving along as well as they have, they are uh, and have been lately with Omicron and all that. So, yeah. Awesome. No, and I, I just, uh, uh, totally honest, I've been part of uh, Music City Con with Mark before. It's a great conference, a lot of great conversations. Um, really enjoyed when uh, I took part in it a few years ago with you. Yeah, thank you, man. I want to thank Mark for joining the podcast. Great conversation, really enjoyed. Please like. Subscribe, follow, comment, anything you want. Open to suggestion, open to conversation. I'm Matt Rose. This is Tattoo Code and Data Flows. Stay cheeky, application security world.